staggering, amazing, astounding. How are the proper words that you could utilize to basically look at this drop in new cases from multiple continents almost at the exact same time? You're talking different hemispheres, different time zones, obviously, climate, so on and so forth. Almost as if someone just basically turned a switch off. Now, keep in mind, what we're looking at right here is the y-axis. And the y-axis is going to have different values where the chart set up here. And this is new cases smooth. Our date we're starting off on is January 4th. So even though you're looking at all of Asia, you're looking at a slight drop down to about, I'd say, 11,000 cases. Africa, you're starting as a high as seven, well, actually probably close to 18,000. And then all of a sudden a massive drop. Look at that. Look how fast that drop is in new cases in an incredibly short period of time. Remember, for those that follow this channel, we started noticing this drop about the second week of January and started focusing on it. And it was identical in different areas. Look at Africa. But look at the timing. More, more so, look at the timing. Look at the peaks. That's the part, that correlation is so incredible, at least between North America, Africa, and Europe. The peaks were about the exact same time and the declines almost almost close to about the exact same slope on negative. So Europe at 60,000 max down to about 11,000. North America were as high as 250,000 new cases and we're talking on a daily basis down to now about 55, 60,000. Now remember many of these can uh, include asymptomatic and so on and so forth. Oceana, yes, one of our cottons. These are our cottons. So Oceana, uh, this is where charts can be real deceptive. Again, focus on the y-axis. What do we have here? Zero goes up to 25. Zero goes up to 250,000. So I, it shouldn't even really be included in the charts, but we're looking at, you know, six to maybe seven or eight cases for Oceana. And then South America. Now keep in mind, even though you're not seeing much of a drop, look at your y-axis, 50,000. So about 45,000 there. North America, even though we've had an incredibly rapid drop, is still not as low than all of South America. So that gives you a brief run through as far as how incredibly staggering, astounding, amazing uh, that this drop has occurred. Now, keep in mind, too, people go, well, it's the vaccinations, whatever it is, and that's a really tough correlation to push. For example, if we look at the vaccination rate uh, right now, if we go according to uh, our world and data, we're at about 5.09% the United States. And look at the rest of the world. So when you look at that data, accordingly, vaccinations play a very small role. Uh, what does, again... I don't know. I really don't know. But there is some uh, credence to the fact is that sometimes, you know, even RNA-based life form can be maybe um, sentient to some extent. But who knows? That's a really stretch on the hypothesis. But however, though, look at that drop. All right, let's get right into the data as follows. To begin with, to start, could a nasal spray prevent, and we'll go back to the, our data analytics in a little bit. Could a nasal spray prevent coronavirus transmission? Now, the crime in reference to this is basically, this is research which really looked into it back in November 5th. Now, I would have liked to have seen this brought to the forefront a lot earlier because when you look at how effective this nasal spray is, now keep in mind, it only let, prevents, or I should not going to use that word prevent, but, you know, is effective for about 24 hours. But let's see exactly how well it prevented this particular virus, at least in ferrets. To begin with, let's look at what happened. Now we're looking at the study. Let's bring up the highlights, for example. All right, here we are. In this study, carried on collaboration, da, 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 100% of the untreated ferrets were infected with the virus. Look at the living conditions in the cage, uh, upon their cage mates. Now keep in mind, they want to have close contact for a prolonged period of time while testing the nasal spray. Now this part is just, again, to overuse the word astounding but however though 
it was really incredible because as we look right here, after 24 hours, the intense direct contact among the ferrets tested revealed none of the treated ferrets caught the virus infected from the cage mates and their viral load, viral load was precisely zero. That, I mean, just not, I mean, just not developing, you know, symptoms of the virus itself, but a viral load of precisely zero. Let that sink in. It's like, for example, a suit of armor against, the, I'm not talking like face shields or face covering. I'm talking literally a suit of armor in reference to at least prevention of SARS-CoV-2 taking hold, which is basically kind of what it does. Now, keep in mind, the nasal spray itself lasts about 24 hours. Now, they are kind enough to print all the information out in reference to the study methodology, so on and so forth, including the lipotip, uh, lipotip, blah, 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 lipopeptide synthesis. So you have all the information needed. What I will do too on the YouTube channel is I will link to the PDF so you can see the methodologies, the production, so on and so forth, everything that they covered through uh, the manufacturing of this particular nasal spray. So this is common information which could benefit humanity in a huge way, not just against the current SARS-CoV-2, but other variants potentially as well. And this is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly powerful research, which is an end game research. For example, even if it only lasts 24 hours, let's say, for example, people are using this nasal spray and people would just advise, hey, you know, spray up. We'll use that word instead, instead of mask up. Spray up for about the next, 20, uh, next seven days. And you have people with no viral load. I mean, no viral load. I'm not talking asymptomatic. I'm talking no viral load. That could be an incredible disruption in reference to the vector of transmission of a particular virus itself. Now, let's look at confounding information. Let's say, for example, information which is contradictory to a common belief. And I include this because it's important because you have to look at everything from every perspective and not be stuck in assumptions, superstition. Asthmatics, no higher risk of dying from COVID review of studies of 587,000 people. Now, that doesn't mean that COPD and BMI and things like that can play a role, but at least in reference to asthmatics itself. Now, the part that is the most amazing in reference to this research, now, doesn't mean that asthma is a prevention or involves resistance. It means there could be something else involved in reference to lifestyle that can inhibit uh, the virus from taking hold as severely. Look at this. They showed that people with asthma had a 14%, let me highlight once again, a 14% lower risk of acquiring COVID-19 and were significantly less likely to be hospitalized. Now, is that contrary to popular belief? Or what? And now you have to say it's belief. If you're looking at data and science, you know, that's what it is. We're not looking to basically say, oh, I believe this or I believe that. Regardless of what you believe, the data is quite and quite intriguing. Uh, and that's a lot of information. That was peer reviewed in the Journal of Asthma itself. That's just fascinating. To move forward, researchers proved that ozone is effective in disinfecting coronavirus. So here and now we go from ultraviolet light, we look for other aspects, we actually looked at tons of different ultraviolet lights, different spectrums, so on and so forth. We're effective as well. This one is extremely promising as well too. So you think about schools, auditoriums, you know, if we would have just started incorporating UV light as well, as far as disinfecting with, even in public areas with the safer forms of UV light, now you can, now you can uh, coordinate that with ozone. So instead of trying to disinfect and spray chemicals left and right, which obviously we discovered last week, trigger asthma attacks, irony. But however, though, use these tools. They're available. They're incredible. And they work with the regular SARS-CoV-2 virus. They worked in a bio, um, a bio lab three or whatever it was. Research have proved that ozone is effective in disinfecting coronavirus. Now, this is amazing. They demonstrate a high level of disinfection within minutes, even on surfaces not typically disinfected with manually applied liquid disinfectants, with a statistical success rate above 90%, according to the doctor. 
The method involves inexpensive and readily available technology which can be utilized to disinfect hospitals, schools, hotels, and aircraft and entertainment halls. It's there. It's available. Like the UV light, we knew from the very beginning. Uh, back, we the UV light was discovered to be effective back in what was our first article on this back in March of last year. So again, science, wonderful, great breakthroughs, but this, to me personally, in my perspective, the worst pandemic ever, as far as bureaucratic intrusion and disruption in the free flow of information and the incorporation and implementation of many, many innovative things, which could have done a wonderful job at breaking this vector. Now, I'm not saying the virus is over as yet, because back in June and July, remember last year, luckily it was on its down route. We were running a Monte Carlo simulation, Monte Carlo simulation, and it looked like it was on its way out. But when they started testing other individuals and younger populations, obviously the data began to change. So beautiful, beautiful research as well. Also fully published as far as the types of what they use. And also too, it's kind of interesting. Uh, this breach right breach, <laughs> For like I'm talking like it's some sort of like bulkhead. This basically information right here, uh, breach reference to basically uh, obviously censorship. So this breach in the, the fact checkers, so to say, basically shows that these are already available tools which can do wonderful, wonderful effect and benefit many, many people in public areas and get businesses open, life going, so on and so forth. And at least in the very, very least, give the impression that something is being done in a positive manner that gives the population's control over the set of circumstances at hand. And empowering people is very, very important, more so than disempowering them, having count on certain things that the government does depend upon, which, yeah, you know where I'm going, but you see what I mean. Data is there, link is there, technology is available today. Use it, please. All right. Now, this is one thing I have up, which is kind of interesting, because it gives an idea on how little we actually understand viruses. Now, keep in mind, we are actually talking about viruses that have DNA in the genetic material as far as our RNA. So that's important. So scientists identify over 140,000 viruses species in the gut. Half never seen before. That just tells you how much we still have to go in learning. And of course, since we once we think we got it all down, like for example, a long time ago about brain regeneration, neurons and neurons, then something comes up which disrupts the entire spectrum once again. This is incredibly fascinating because the complexity and the interaction between 140,000, I'm talking viruses, viral species living in the human gut, is just an incredible, incredible, awesome uh, implication in order for understanding our situational awareness and how little we actually understand even of ourselves to this state. Now, this is kind of cool because a lot of people don't know what phages is or phages is, whatever they are, but let's look at it. So you have 140,000 viral species living in the gut. So not all viruses are bad per se. Now keep in mind, once again, we're talking about DNA uh, viruses with DNA as opposed to basically RNA, which is a really important part to highlight. The researchers brought it up and they wanted to, um, you know, you know, basically draw that distinction so people don't get confused. And second thing is we're taking from healthy uh, individuals. Now, wonderful research again, as far as the information that's out there. Now. Before I show you, many people don't know what a, ph a phage looks like, but before I show you what a phage looks like, I love the, the analogy here as far as when they develop respect. Now keep in mind, this is Brett Bar 2018 as far as the study. So this was not that long ago. When they actually start calling these viruses, which actually help the body attack bad bacteria and who knows what else, they refer to them as the puppet masters. Now, for those not familiar with what a phage looks like, I know we're taking a little bit of an offshoot here, but it helps you gain respect of where we are biologically in our true uh, understanding of everything that's going on. So the puppet masters, right? Well, this is what the puppet masters look like. 
Now you see that right there? They actually look like little tiny robots. It's like from a science fiction. So for example, I really, really encourage you to take a look at what uh, phages look like. And let's see if we can get uh, basically a regular look here. Yeah, here's a drawing. Let's see what this guy right there. That's yeah, from uh, Wikipedia. This is what they look like. There, look at that. That, see, th this is the part which is just incredible. And really to encourage people to get involved and in looking at clinical research and things like that. That is inside everyone's body as far as I know. And obviously 140,000 in the gut and half which we are totally unknown. They are like little tiny robot machines. I mean, if you had to say, hey, you know, you know, nano machinery or whatever it is, or nanites, that's freaking amazing. That right there is just amazing. And these occupy a large part of our body, which are really, really uh, are, are wonderful defenses against uh, certain ailments which can attack the human uh, genome. But however, though, that's, that's amazing. Seriously, that is freaking amazing. All right, but let's get right into the information. Now we're going to go back into the data. Not a lot out there. I'm sorry. I just keep on getting lost looking at that. It just amazes me. All right, but now let's get into the data analytics. All right, let's go to the really the first part of the top. Ah, well, how much I got here? Do, 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 do. Let's see if we discovered anything new. All right, here is our mortality to uh, new cases smooth per million, new deaths smooth per million. This is looking on a global scale. So this is our world in data. So this is the entire planet. Uh, mortality percentage of positive cases beginning to drop again. And again, we looked at, you know, outside of Israel, which has one third of the population vaccinated, the United States was at 5.3% you know, or whatever. And let's look at the data as it gets more into detail. Da, da, da. Great Britain, again, it's the timing, which just, I hope that they look at, you know, in the future to get some sort of basically solid hypothesis I can understand it dropping slowly in one population, another like a deck of cards. But literally, the entire, entire house of cards fell at the exact same time. Look at this. That, again, outside of our Asian friends, which basically bypassed the entire virus. Uh, look at this. It's just basically boom, 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 boom. Same time. That's new cases moved per million. This is in the past 30 days. Sweden, eh. But still, the deaths are pretty low. You'll, you'll see, look in a second. Here's where it began to drop. I highlighted that in red right there so you can see. Boom, 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 boom. And so they're saying as low as November. Yeah, possibly. But you know what? You could actually say as low as August, uh, more so. Case of positive rate. Originally, we were tracking. Here's your positivity rate as far as your testing. New cases moved per million. January 11th, 753. February 20th, 216. Look at that. Look at your positivity rates. Follow the numbers there. Began to drop, drop, drop. Began to rise a little bit. So I'm being a little bit cautious. It went down to a real, I mean, the positivity really began to drop into the 7 range. But then it began to rise slightly. But however, though, still, regardless of that, maybe less people are being tested. 216 compared to 753 from January 11th. Think about that. USA, there's another drop. Because I had to keep on looking at it. I had to keep on doing the charts. New deaths per million. All right, here we are. Sweden's still far below the USA and Great Britain and our Asian friends. Uh, now, remember, we did the Sweden thing because Fauci had to say, oh, we're not Scandinavian countries. And again, this is the least scientific pandemic I've ever seen, could ever imagine. Um, gosh forbid, it should have been anything worse. Uh, but otherwise, outside of that, new deaths per million. Uh, Sweden at 3.1. Uh, new deaths per million USA, 5.738. Pretty precipitous drop, still just the same. And that's as of, uh, well, that was of yesterday. It's now the 21st. All right, so here we go. Do, 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 looking at that. All right. And here's our eight United. This is to get perspective because I can't stand the lack of international reporting inside the United States because all I do is get the news from a news pool. One person writes it for everyone. Uh, new deaths USA versus all of Asia. Look at this precipitous drop once again. Now I'm stuck on the word precipitous. And just to give you a perspective, how much geographically, geocentric, I should say, 
the virus played a role in the United States compared to the rest of the world, which the rest of the world, you know, took a look at it, but obviously the populations weren't as affected as uh, severely, which is another uh, mission for epidemiologists to look at what works in the rest of the world and what did not work in our hometown. So here's all our countries we're competing against. Armenia, still the closest people that have the total dust per million. And there's USA right there. And USA is obviously this, this line right there. All right, mortality, USA versus all of Asia. I have to do it, not because of any disrespect uh, towards mortality. But again, you have to look at it to see if the data is running awry. And it's been this long, and we're doing this much worse than the rest of, you know, somebody else then you have to start being introspective and we don't ask questions about ourselves we just basically you know who knows more laws more draconian measures total mortality usa versus all of asia bah, bah, bah. here we have asia total mortality 391,362 out of a population of 4 billion 463 million united states total mortality 497,597 out of a population of just 329 million there's our data right there uh so looking at Asia, one poor soul between every 11,404 people. The United States, one poor soul out of every 661. Again, what they, a lot of places like in Asia, places like that, they use you know, you know, UV lights, so on and so forth. Uh, they were very innovative in a lot of the medical treatments. They were not at, adverse to vitamins such as vitamin D and selenium and zinc and so on and so forth. They did an all-hands-on approach as to us. We, had, we incorporated a lot of selection bias, and then it became political, and then it got worse. So there it is right there, and this is the world. Totally, this is when vaccination started kicking in as far as percentage of the world. Very tough to draw a correlation between the introduction of viruses, viruses vaccines, and that could be conspiratorial on its own, and the, the drop in uh, basically new cases smooth. Um, again, I allude to the sci-fi mentality to where maybe the correlation and timing is so many things which are eerie as the future moves forward and we start looking at the data and there's less political bias involved in looking at the data. There's going to be a lot of heavy duty mysteries, uh, which will be take years and years to solve and look at that puzzle and solve that puzzle if the puzzle is even solvable all right there it is again just like someone flipped the switch boom all right there's our cases this is the world uh the vaccine to mortality thing looks like it's dropped because a lot of people have moved past on as the case began to drop so it changed it skewed the figures a little bit so yeah you see this 0.87 which shows a strong correlation between vaccination and mortality and a negative 0.95 far reduction in cases, but no, it's still too early. You don't have enough data. Even if you ran a Kendall Tau or, you know, whatever it is, you don't have enough data. All right, pretty graphs. All right, this is the mortality percentage we're looking at as it began to rise, see 2.9, 2.63. This right here is your new death smooth per million. This is the entire world. So to 1.6 and down to 1.2. And new cases smooth per million went from 93 January 10th, down to 45, February 20th. And this is the entire world. All right, let's look at more of our data. And the data became so perplexing, you know, the, um, this model right here doesn't even count anymore. Sure, give you an example. All right, let's look at our, our regression right here. It's like, boom. When you see these dots go all over the place and you no longer have a line there, that means your model sucks. And right now, this model sucks. Look at the Q, Q plot. It's like all of a sudden, boom, 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 boom. Oh, yeah, I got something. Yeah, this is works. I can actually make a prediction. Nope. And nope. And then residuals. Nope. <laughs> all over the place. New deaths to cases per million world. As you see the drop there. It's, that is forming a pretty solid correlation. Uh, this is new cases. You're going to be blind because obviously you see you know, North America compared to the rest of the world. This is a good perspective because this is actually the same y-axis. And so you get an idea on how much North America actually skewed the entire global figures. Uh, 
and in particular the United States more than any place else. So this is going to be, again, another mystery to be looked in, looked at as soon as the political climate begins to cool down. All right, there it is. Asia, new case is smooth. New case is smooth. Uh, this is Africa. Europe, again, look at the timing. Asia, really weird here. Difference in timing, but look at Africa, Europe, and North America. You see the weird correlation, almost the exact same freaking day. Uh, Oceania, remember they, uh, the virus pretty much passed over them. So they're, which is really interesting because none, they don't correlate too much with Asia. I wanted to check. South America, which is basically stagnant all over the place. And this, of course, is a shaded area plot, which just shows the entire world. To proceed forward, correlations, do, do, do. All right, we're at the top here. Let's go down. Uh, where the people fully vaccinated went away. Ba -ba Boom. We'll go back to that in a second. Life expectancy. Japan looks like they've had this is current. So obviously they had a few deaths. Uh, population density. Now nah, I'm not going to show much of anything. Uh, remember, we're trying to find correlations because in the beginning when we started doing data analytics, for those not familiar, we ran, we ran charts on everything, trying to find any correlation above a 0.7 and we which means it's pertinent uh to the to the virus couldn't find any uh looking down da, 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 new desperate per million uh yeah look at this is what do we have for the united states 5.738 so last week keep in mind we're at 5.738 deaths per million Last week, we were at 9.6. Think about it. That is just insane. So now, the United States at 5.738. So let's just put 5.74. And let's see exactly how much better now the United States is doing than the rest of the world. So, yeah. So we've actually moved up in the um, – we're actually – we didn't do pretty good. When we first started this, remember, uh, we were at 3.6. So we followed this entire chart. 5.738. And yeah, that looks really cool. World masks. Again, we're trying to find correlations, not trying to not trying to, you know, be disrespectful to any one school of thought. Alright, so we are up to date with February uh well, it's, that's all. Sorry, uh, it's 2020. All right, so but let's say as much as February 20th, 2021, uh, as far as that inform information is used, we we'll using Zimbabwe, as our, which is obviously we're up to date. Uh, da -da -da, we're looking at the right year. Facial coverings, looking at our data, it's, it's zero to four, so we have five spaces. Uh, correlations, facial covering to facial coverings, very weak correlation model, but still just the same. Now not showing anything. Uh, countries which are out of four, uh, mask mandatory, tons of them. Uh, threes, you know, which give you an idea. Three means required in all shared public spaces outside the home. Uh, again, the data is not, is inconclusive because we already know states inside the United States, uh, which have no mask requirements any longer. So you really can't say the United States is out of four. Did they move it to three yet? Now it's a lot of four. So this is really kind of an iffy chart. Uh, for looking at that. And Syria, I guess, no longer has a mask mandate. That's something new. Now, Sweden. Sweden last week was one. They moved to a two. Kind of like, kind of past the fact, but they did move to a two, but it's like they reacted to that steep increase in positivity cases. Positivity cases. Sounds like a um, motivational movie. Uh, and people testing positive for SARS-CoV-2, let's put it that way. Uh, but otherwise, outside of that, it was like, it was like, all right, then they put a mask on after the fact. So here we go. Let's look at our information. This is going to be good too because I want you to focus on this. All right, this is basically uh, new cases smooth per million. I want to show you how many, uh, in a small sampling, how many came close to 800 to 900 cases per million regardless of the mask level. All right, we see the drops. Sweden, they see this, you see right here, they started going up and then they raised to mask level two after being maskless 
forever. And but it's like, why now? Not why back then? You know what I mean? But I guess they did it, and now they just I don't know. And so again, it's, to me, it's superstition uh, in reference to doing it that late in the game. All right, so here we go. And so boom, boom, boom. Columbia, Columbia. Uh, cases per million, tests per thousands. You know it's the drop. Japan, they went up to a mask level of three. They're uh, still at a one. Uh, they were pretty low on the deaths per million. You see right there. Again, the Asian, our Asian friends, whatever happened, whatever worked, it just never took off. Thank goodness. Uh, Japan again, there it is. Uh, regardless of that, look at the drop. Even though they're only... 50 cases per million. Still, it's the timing is just so uh, weird. It's just, again, it's at the exact same time. What happened on January 4th that just changes dynamics so dynamically? All right, scrolling down. Finland, they got a little nervous for a second, and they went up. Finland... Yeah, not much change. Finland's the only people that were really I know they don't have a lot of infections, but not much has moved for Finland. Um, India, look at this. Deaths per million. You're talking India. India, one of the most populous countries on the planet. Seriously. And that's amazing. Uh, cases per million. Look at that. All right. Uh, and as you can see, the red, they're testing more tests per thousand. And they're only coming up with 10 cases per million. All right, Spain. That same drop, exact same time. Boom, boom, boom. Now, remember, I told you to focus on this number. A lot of them, a lot of the countries hit right about the exact same level. Uh, you'll find a lot of correlate. They hit about 800 to 900. And then once they hit 800 to 900, boom. Herd mentality, mentality, herd mentality. Yes, herd mentality. Those, if you're not, if you're watching this video, then you're not part of the herd mentality. Uh, so basically, here we are. There's that. And then France, they do a big way early. Then just, I don't know. They didn't follow the same model. See, it's really weird geography-wise. And they did more testing, and they had a big gap there. So it began to break down. Uh, same timing, remember? So you look at this number, cases per million, they all passed about the exact same threshold in cases per million on the exact same day. On the exact same day. And then it began to drop. I mean, even if you're talking two or three countries out of, you know, obviously out of many, you're still looking at an incredibly, incredible, weird correlation. But we're talking a lot of countries, exact same day, exact same cases per million, the exact same time there's a drop. All right, so here we go. Boom, boom, boom. And Italy, uh, they began to drop, which is good. But look at this. Italy is interesting because look at the amount of testing they're doing and the cases per million at 200. So that's actually a pretty strong drop. And we'll go to the next one. States. We got tons of fun on the states. We're going to be using Florida and Iowa as our controls now because you need to have places that don't do anything, so to say. So you have something to compare it to. Positive per 100,000. California, right there, pretty low. Iowa, lower than California. Florida, lower than New York. Uh, and so here we are. Don't pass that one because not enough information. Mortality increases, not enough information. Uh, where did that? Da, 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 test per 100,000. Iowa, guess none. Do I have the, the data table there? I don't have it up there. California, pretty low. Uh, Florida, lower than California. And New York, right on line with Florida. And again, look at your control measures. Is, is what you're doing worth the collateral damage if it's not doing anything? It means if you're in your, it's one thing to be subjective in what sounds good when you're by yourself. It's nothing to be considered a a I don't want to say the word leader because a lot of a lot of these bureaucrats aren't leaders. They're just people who have the ability to enact laws. Leadership and lawmaking are two separate things. But otherwise, outside of that, it's basically you know all because you can do it for the sake of doing it. 
you have to look at collateral damage. And I don't like the infallibility power being in the hands of just one person or just a couple of people uh, without some sort of a think tank, not an echo chamber, a think tank. All right, Florida, New York, California, Iowa. Death increase, that's a little thinner lines there. There we are, there we are. Hospitalizations per 100,000. Remember, Iowa went mask free. We're gonna look at the other data in a little bit. Uh, who's blue, Florida and California. And New York is still kind of up there. All right, and there's our data there. There's a death increase, positive increases, da, da, da. All right, now we go to hospital occupancy. All right, let's go right to the top there. All right, and this is where we're going to have our comparative data. So here we go. All right, let's see. We're looking at data as of February 20th. So that was so 30 minutes ago. So here we go. Inpatient beds, inpatient use estimates for COVID. All right, and still our standard there. Put in perspective, IC beds, IC beds estimated. This number of beds, number of beds being used. So blue is number of beds. Orange is the number of beds being used. Red, remember that line right there? We put at 72. So our historical average occupancy as far as usage is 72%. And um, yeah, this is where the states are. There's California, Hawaii, da, 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 all the way down the line. They're pretty close to the historical numbers. And we're also talking winter time too. And so there's your orange as far as those individuals with COVID, uh, which are in the hospitals. All right. So we keep on going down, 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 down. Do, do, do. Here we are. Alaska, I threw in there because it was a data anomaly. I should not have kept it out there. But you see, for example, here, inpatient beds used and inpatient beds, even though inpatient beds being used by people with COVID has gone down, it doesn't mean that people with elective surgeries, cancer surgeries, a lot of surgeries would have been delayed are finally being accepted into these hospitals. So you may see a spike in inpatient beds used because people have delayed surgeries, even though you could have that go down. All right, California, look at this. Look at this. Green again is inpatient beds used by COVID individuals for COVID cases. All right, you see, but even though you're inpatient beds, you're Views are about stable, uh, inpatient beds available, about stable. But look at the decline. All right, let's keep on going. New York, still decline. Uh, and if you look at the data, well, the California, you can't say, but New York is pretty much, the inpatient beds used for COVID is probably below that of May of last year. Uh, and this is when I mistakenly thought when looking at the Monte Carlo model that basically we're out of the pandemic until whatever happened happened. Florida, and here's our control, one of our controls. There we are. It looks better than the other other states which have tons of uh, lockdowns, quarantines, and you name it. Iowa, no mask. I want to look at that right there. See? Whoop, went to the target big all of a sudden. All right, there's that. And there, now it's back. All right, so there it is. You see Iowa, no mask. Boom, down there, North Dakota, no mask. Again, put yourself in a position as a decision maker. <laughs> Take the word leader away because I'm not going to use it. I don't, I don't. Leader, you got to earn respect, not just be elected to office. And so basically, yes, so the decision makers, you're a decision maker. And uh, so what do you base your decision upon? Data or just sounds good? You know, you can't say if I spin a circle three times, and that's to prevent the virus. Why not just do it? You know, no, you can't just do things for the sake because it sounds good. People get hurt with collateral decisions based upon inaccurate information. All right, there's that. Montana, no mask. Going down again. Mississippi, no mask. So the reason it's important in reference to no mask because a lot of the naysayers, we're automatically stating that once they started relaxing those man, mask mandates, that there was going to be increase in cases. Now, the thing about it is, yes, there was an increase in cases in November, December, where it was relaxed in September, October. But even in the states which had draconian lockdowns, you still had the same increase. So again, what sounds great in a lab or controlled setting doesn't necessarily mean it works in the real world. Still to this day, no one's actually told people if they have a, a mask and a beard that 
we're in a face covering with the you know unless they have a special face covering with the beard is not going to do much those that you know no so let's move forward and um what i'm trying to say is a lot of exceptions to the rule with things don't work but you think they work and sometimes when you are under the impression that a person with a beard on has a surgical mask on that you're somehow protected from getting ill from the birth of a beard then you may want to study uh mask you a little bit more so here it goes now let's go into our vaccination rates let's see what we got here do, 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 here we are our data is up to date as of remember they're going by week so even though it's not february 22nd yet it's the week leading up to february 22nd so this is our vaccine delivery and so on and so forth now the data which i compiled here keep in mind is based upon second dose distribution now even though you know, it's showing that only 5% of the people are fully vaccinated so far. Our data is based upon if there was proper logistical administration of the second dose, if everyone was vaccinated as the vaccines were being produced, then this is the percentage of people that should be fully vaccinated. It has very little to do with vaccine production, you'll see the problems, as much as vaccine administration. So let's proceed as follows. Do, 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 do. Lots of green numbers. Here is our um, total allocations of the first of the Pfizer one and the Moderna. And so then what we do is we just comp combine them, of course, based upon the population. So if, if, keep in mind, this is, you know, talking about 5 million, 40 million, so on and so forth, scientific notation. I should shut that off. But if everyone was vaccinated with all the vaccines being distributed, we would be right about that percentage as far as uh, the current population, the total vaccine administration visually. Data wise, here we are as far as uh, data frame. So if everyone's vaccinated accordingly, 15, 16% of Alabama, 24% of Alaska, uh, you know, California would be at 15%. So when we look at the, the total vaccine administration, and let's see if we can pull it back up here. And actually, the amount of vaccine that's being reported, 5.9%. See the problem here? 5.9% as of February 19th. But with all the vaccine that's out there, we should be at these numbers. This based upon the second dose being delivered. So we're at one third of the people are being vaccinated based upon total supply. And so again, it's don't want it to be conspiratorial in reference to it, but obviously there's there's a problem with administration and distribution. So there we are. All right, and that was updated as of February 20th as well. And now we're going to jurisdictions as far as hospital usage and vaccine delivery. Again, we're just going down. Hospital to vaccine comparison. You see the uniformity as far as delivery of the second dose. Now, I can't use it as saying this if people have been fully vaccinated. Just some saying if everyone was fully vaccinated, it would be right here with that second dose. But obviously, we're off by two thirds. So there we are. Uh, percentage of ICU bed utilization uh, compared to percentage of inpatient bed utilization. So there you are as far as your data. And we're going back down to do, 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 do. What's the number here? There's your numbers in your data frame. Data frame, data frame, data frame. This is the administration. I gotta fix this for you guys. So next time you see it, but you can see all the second dose administration as far as the information. And that is it. We're only at 43 minutes and 44 minutes down. So, and again, just as a side note, the information, for example, a lot of it's from healthdata.gov. It's COVID tracking, uh, our world and data, Beautiful, beautiful um, uh, data sources from um, OWID, which I probably would uh, recommend more than anything else. Although, as a second side note too, many for you data analytic individuals, if you are running to HTTP 403 errors as far as pulling data, don't worry, I'll get back to the English stuff in a second. Uh, for example, you can, you can pull the data from these sites but you got to save it as a file first, as opposed to just reading it, and then you'll be able to uh, you'll be able to uh, overcome that HTTP, HTTP 403 error. 
uh, I mean, your IP address has been blocked or whatever it is. You can still get around it. You can circumvent it by actually downloading it and reopening as a file, as you see the data here. All right, then we also covered too, as far as that, we looked at nasal spray can prevent coronavirus. Incredible, incredible breakthrough back in November, but validated today and still can be used for multiple different variants. And you know, if they could offer protection in humans like they did in ferrets for 24 hours, what a firewall you could build against any contagion which of question. In fact, just, just for the heck of it, do, um, if you had a uh, nasal spray like this, if you're going into an area, for example, there's a lot of transit, train station, airport, wherever it is, and just to say, hey, I'm going to be on a plane for eight hours and just spray this nasal spray and it blocks the locking functions of the uh, where this virus is trying to hook onto. As you can see by the, the cool little video here. Uh, great. And so what a wonderful breakthrough. Uh, but I'll have the PDF link there for you to be able to follow so you can pull up the ingredients on your own. Asthmatics, wow. Is that confounding or not confounding? Is that perplexing or what? 14% lower risk of acquiring and significantly less be hospitalized by the virus. Again, if you always ask the question, I would answer it, do it be more likely? And of course, that's what data is for. Not for what I believe, but what is actually uh, panning out. Um, basically, ozone, again, one of another many, many ways to uh, circumvent the virus in schools, auditoriums, wherever, hospitals, hotels, which would be really nice if they just used it and instead of debated it. It just said, hey, if it works. And of course, uh, many of the equipment that's already out there is uh, pool purity, uh, for example. Yeah, you look that up and you'll find out exactly what pool purity is. And again, it's out there, it's available. And my, the irony here is the Corona discharge generator, which we know what Corona means, but still, there's a, there's a mild irony to that. 140,000 viruses in the species gut. We're talking DNA with some DNA fragments in it. Uh, and half of them are known. Again, just to give you perspective of how little this actually is known, how much more we have to learn. Uh, beautiful data as well. And scary guys. Yes, those are the guys that infect 140,000 viral species of these guys alone sitting in your gut. Again, Rafter Channel signing off. Data sources will be there for you. I'll post this on YouTube. And um, and then we'll just take it there. Gratitude. Thank you again every Tuesday. I may do the video on this if there's enough information there to actually do a video on. It's pretty self-explanatory as it goes. But again, amazing, amazing. And what an incredibly, incredibly precipitous drop. We'll follow it again first thing uh, next week just to make certain if this trend is continuing. Uh, maybe we'll try to uh, make a determination of the slope of this drop so we can make some predictive models. Even though the predictive models I had before kind of just fell apart. I mean literally just fell apart. That's QQ plot. That's like bad. But otherwise outside of that, gratitude, thank you and look forward to you all next time. See you all next time. Bye bye bye.